You guys, I feel like I should have made this podcast so, so, so long ago, and I don't know why it's taken so long for this to come out, but today we're going to talk about how to prepare your business for having a baby. How can you plan as a planner for having a baby, especially when that timeline is really, really unknown? Hi, if you're new here, my name is Jamie Wolfer. I'm a wedding planner. Uh, Most of the things I do on the internet is I help couples plan their weddings in a very affordable manner because that's where my heart's at. Even though I like can't work budget weddings, I still make content for budget weddings. But a whole second half of what I do is I help planners get started because that is like a passion project of mine. I did not have an easy start when it came to the wedding industry. In fact, it was very rocky. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to make I'm going to hopefully make a difference. Um, and now I train other wedding planners to get started and I send them on their way and it's glorious because I get to train wedding planners to be, uh, excuse me, badass. And then I get to recommend them to all of the people who watch my videos because I can't be everywhere at once. So it's just, it's like this beautiful cycle that somehow we've created here. But one thing I get asked about a lot in the mentorship program and like we have these ask Jamie, (laughs) I don't know why I laugh like that. (laughs) These ask Jamie things where, uh, people can kind of fill in the blank. Um, of what they're curious about. And a lot of women running these small businesses, they just got married. They're aware that children could be in their near future or they might be even actively trying for a baby. And they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. They're like, how do I still build this business if I have this big giant question mark hanging above my head? We could probably have a whole nother podcast about infertility because that is something that is a journey that My husband and I were on for like four and a half years trying for our fourth, our fourth baby. Secondary infertility is wild, absolutely wild. But that's probably not the podcast for today. Today, we're going to talk about how to get your business set up. And if you're watching this on YouTube, this is typically advertised over on a podcast that I have called The Union Podcast. Together, we wed. Because together, as wedding vendors, we figure this out and we make weddings happen. Together, we wed. So what are the tactile steps that you can take as a business owner to prepare for baby? I'm going to speak specifically to wedding planners, but I feel like this could really branch over into different zones. How does an entrepreneur prepare for a baby, especially when the timeline is completely unknown? So without further ado, let's just jump right on into it. First and foremost, you need to make sure that you have some sort of language in your contract. Now, remember, this can be very like action oriented. So if you are in a place where you can take notes, please feel free to do so. If not, uh, like if you're driving or something or doing other things, then pay attention to the show notes. Hopefully we'll have like a little description listed out there for you. But you are going to need to make sure that you have some language in your contract that says, if you can't be there, you will provide a suitable replacement. There are a couple different ways you can say this. I'm not a lawyer. I can't actually tell you what to put in your contract, but this is language that I put in mine. So if you would like to follow the suit, this is what I'd recommend. In the event or in the case of an emergency, Wolfer and Company will provide a planner to basically cover the contracted services in the event that your original designated planner is unavailable. This is something I include in all of our contracts or proposals, depending on where you want to put that. So clients know that there's an option that I might not make it. Initially did this in my contract because I wanted another baby. Full disclosure, like I wanted one and I wasn't quite sure what that time frame was going to look like. But it also has secondary benefits of like last minute something comes up, someone passes away, your car breaks down. I had this happen on my way to a rehearsal. My car broke down. I had a Subaru that actually ended up having some sort of wild recall happen to it. And I couldn't make it to the rehearsal. Luckily, I made it to the wedding next day. But I had this contingency in place in my contract to go, just in case something doesn't go well, we will come up with a replacement. All right? And that is a job as a wedding planner that you will need to fulfill. One, because that's your duty to your client. And two, because that means you keep the finances from this, right? Like we want to make sure we're not doling out returns. That, that's not the primary reason. But we also want to make sure we're being business savvy about this. So language in your contract that says, in the event that the planner assigned to you, the principal planner assigned to you is unavailable, my company, the company name insert here, will provide a suitable replacement. Now you're like, great. Uh, where does that replacement come from? Well, there's a couple different options. One, you can train somebody up. I highly recommend this. It can be pretty difficult to find the right person to find the right fit for what you're trying to do, especially because sometimes they want to start their own business and you're worried that you're going to lose them. So that's a question I always ask people when they first sign on with me as an assistant. I'm like, hey, tell me clear. I don't care. Like, (laughs) respectfully, I don't care. Do you want to start your own business or do you want to like work as a wedding planner under somebody else? Because I will just mentor you differently. I don't care at all. I will teach you how to start your business. It is no skin off my back. You are not going to steal people from me. It's all good, right? But if you'd like to venture out on your own, I'm going to teach you one way. If you'd like to stick with me, I'm going to teach you another way. One, because you don't need to learn all the business logistics behind the scenes necessarily. And two, I'm going to teach you to move the same exact way that I do if you are sticking with me, right? 
I'm going to teach you the exact standard operating procedures that I would like you to follow while still being your own person. So I will just teach an assistant differently. So that's one place where you can get one, making sure you are feeding into an assistant that will stay with you, or even if they're going to start their own business, someone that can step in if and or when you find yourself having a baby. And that's a huge, huge reason to be in community. This is one of my favorite parts about the Union Mastermind that we didn't expect. And I always talk about this. I'm such a dweebus, but like we never expected the community to be so freaking powerful. We had planners crossing state lines to help each other out with events. It's so cute. It's so cute. I didn't realize this was going to happen. But you need a planner who will cross a state line or a county line or a city line to come help you. You need community to be involved with, which if you are alone, might I highly recommend come join us in the mastermind. I'm there live every single month answering questions, chatting with y'all. So it's a great way to make sure that you're not doing this alone, but also a great way to make sure you're building up a community that can support you through a season like this. So if you can't find an assistant of your own, make sure you are connecting with other wedding planning companies who think the same way you do. And they don't have to be carbon copy what you do, right? They don't have to be the exact same person or do things exactly the way that you want them to. At this point, sometimes you just need them to get the job done. So maybe we can't be too picky about it, but you need to have contacts before you get to that point. Go to vendor mixers. Um, connect with other wedding planners in your area, join us in the mastermind, get to know other planners in there. So that way, when the time comes, if something does arise, you have people to fall on. Now, regardless of which avenue you go, either training somebody up or going with another planning company to step in and help you out on your behalf, you're gonna need to figure out the financials of this, right? So you're gonna need to figure out how much you're going to pay the assistant now lead planner per hour and or how you are going to pay for another planner to step in and take over this event for you. There needs to be a little bit of understanding with the other planner coming in that you have to take planning or administrative fees. So they're not going to make the same amount that they would off of their own original client. But they also didn't do all of the advertising, all of the hoof work. They didn't do all the contacting, all the planning beforehand necessarily if they're coming in at the last minute, if they're coming in clutch to kind of like swoop in and take over the day for you. So you need to have honest conversations about how to charge what they'd expect. And you need to be understanding of the fact that it might be more expensive to have another full-fledged professional planning company come in to take over the day for you than it would be to have an assistant that you've trained up and now are promoting to a lead planner. So there's going to be a higher cost associated likely with bringing in another planner to take this on for you. But you still need to have an open conversation with them of like, hey, it's probably not going to be as much as if you source this couple on your own. That's understandable. And that all depends on when and where they step into the process. And that's where we need to start talking about overlap. But let's not put the cart before the horse here. So we have it in our contract. We are developing out relationships around us to come step in if a baby does enter into the picture, right? But what we really need you to do right now while you're planning, while you're trying for a baby, you need to start writing down your standard operating procedures because your assistant turned lead planner or an outside planner is not going to know what you want them to do unless you tell them what you want them to do. So what does that look like? What does attire look like? What would you like them to wear? I will never forget the day, and this is ironic because right now I'm wearing an off-the-shoulder shirt, that a wedding planner showed up with an off-the-shoulder shirt with her bra strap showing and like tacky sneakers. And this was uh, years ago before sneakers were like coming back in vogue. And it just, it was not, it was not cute. And it was a black tie wedding. You guys, it was a black tie wedding and she showed up wearing sneakers and her bra showing. And I just died a little inside. So you have to write down your standard operating procedures, even if it's as simple as like, please make sure you don't have bras or underwear showing, you know? I mean, you'd like to think that maybe that's just something you have to say out loud, but what does it look like? What time do they need to show up? Which vendors do they need to greet first? What are offerings that you offer as a wedding planner or that you don't offer? Because as you know, or as you will find out in this industry, we don't all offer the same exact thing. So Maybe you are the type that does set up centerpieces for people and you are working with another planner who's coming in who doesn't do that. They need to know that that is a part of your SOP. That's a part of what you do, a part of what you provide. So when they come in, they don't go, oh no, that's not what we do and contradict the offering that you had. You have to write down your SOPs. Now that's just on the day of. If you are going to have anyone take over long-term care, long-term planning with your clients, you're gonna need to be a lot more specific about what this looks like. What do you do during the first meeting? What do you do during the second meeting, the third, the fourth, the fifth? What does this process look like? In the mastermind, I teach people how to go through the timeline of planning so they don't have to invent it from scratch. So if you're struggling and you're like, I don't know how to plan things from point A 
to wedding day. Like, I don't know what that structure looks like. Please come join me in the mastermind. I, this is what we do over there. So it makes it very easy for me to teach this because it's all chronological. Do you have a chronological order for your clients? If at this point you're starting to get overwhelmed, take a deep breath. It's okay. Baby's not here yet. We have plenty of time to figure this out. All right. But this is only if you want long-term planning to be taken over by somebody else. When we're talking day of, we're talking like, here are the services that we offer on the big day. And here's what I'd like you to wear. Here's how I'd like you to act, et cetera, et cetera. But long-term planning is where you have to start building out a lot more than that. What do those meetings look like? What order do you follow? What services do you offer? Do you call vendors for them? Do you email vendors for them? Do you find vendors for them? And by for them, I mean for the clients. That all needs to be written down. You cannot assume that the person who's coming to step in to take over uh, will be able to do that. Let's put a pin on that for just a sec. This is if we're talking about raising up an assistant to become a lead planner. If you are passing off the client to another planning company, you're going to want to find someone who's similar so the couple is still feeling cared for um, and their needs are being met. However, you don't need to write an SOP for another existing planner. But at this point, we're probably passing off the financials. We're passing off the contract. We're passing everything off and just saying, go with God. You are no longer mine. Like, uh, I hope you guys enjoy your relationship and time together. I'm no longer maybe your planner. That's a full pass off. Again, just to reiterate, the only reason you would need a long-term SOP is if you are training up a planner to become a lead planner within your own company. Okay, so we've talked about contract. We've talked about uh, who's going to come in and step in and take over. We've talked about SOPs. Now let's talk about actually training. Because it's one thing to write it in a book. And it's one thing to put together a packet that says, no bra straps, please, and thank you, sign here. It's another thing to train on the spot. And anyone who's ever worked with me will tell you that I am really bad at training on the spot. <laughs> I can teach. I can teach quite well. I mean, the hundreds of planners we've had go through the mastermind would, <laughs> would probably agree with me. I can teach ahead of time. But when it comes to day of boots on the ground, who doggy? I have a hard time not just jumping in and do every, doing everything for everyone else. I'd be like, no, no, no I just, I'll just handle it. Don't worry. Because <laughs> I want you to like me, but I'm not serving them by teaching them. You need to start getting them actively on events. A couple of pain points that might come from this. One, Jamie, I don't have enough events. Okay, well, that's a problem. We need to escalate the amount of events that you have right now. One, it will pad you financially. Two, it will help your assistant turn into a lead planner a lot more quickly. What does this look like? My favorite hack for this is something that Dave McQueen from Amari Productions said on the podcast forever ago, and that is start posting your services on Craigslist. Just post it on Craigslist, post it for a lower rate. Do not associate it with your brand. You don't need to. Are you, is it going to be a crapshoot? Yes. You don't get to handpick the kind of clients you get. It's just literally churn and burn. But that way we are getting more experience for this planner real quickly. Baptism by fire, baby. Like it's, it's not glam. It's going to be sweaty. <laughs> it's going to be very sweaty. But at this point, like you don't have that luxury, right? If you find out you're pregnant, you don't have three years to train somebody up. You got nine months ish, give or take. Due dates are literally guesses. Don't get me started on pregnancy stuff. Y'all, I get so, I get so passionate about birth. <laughs> it's a fun fact for you that you didn't need to know. Moving on. You need to make sure they have enough events under their belt and you need to make sure that you are actively talking them through these events, whether they are working with you and you are designating activities for them to go do. Hey, you're going to go dismiss all the tables. I need you to pay attention to the catering line and watch and see how quickly that's moving and keep up with it. We want to have all these tables dismissed with food in their plates in the next 30 minutes. Let's go. You know, like giving them, here's the parameters, here's the expectations, go achieve this. You need to be still a lot more on top of passing off those activities to your assistant to bolster them up, give them the confidence to run a wedding day like this. Once you feel confident enough in that area where you can really see that they're shining and they're totally bossing this up and they're like handling all of these details, that's when you can start handing them their own events. Just make sure after every single event, whether you work together or apart, you debrief together. What went well? What didn't go well? What could we have done better? Uh, what were some gaps or holes that we missed that we probably should have been paying attention to? What I find most of the time when I do these debriefs with assistants or other planners, we don't colossally screw up. Usually it's another vendor or like something we did not anticipate. But we still know that we have to have the conversation of like, what can we do to avoid this happening next time? 
So whether you work together or apart, when you're training this person up, you need to have that conversation afterwards. It doesn't have to be night of. It can be the next morning, but night of is usually the most fresh. And again, just to reiterate, to repeat myself, if you need to really bulk up the events, get on Craigslist and start getting events under their belt that way specifically. If you are doing long-term planning and you're aware that this pregnancy is happening, like we're here, we're going with it, everything's safe and secure and happy and healthy. If you were doing longer-term planning, I recommend starting to overlap you and the other planner that you are bringing up to take on this event. If we've got time and it's a longer-term planning, you need to have both of you present for several meetings. This will help in so many ways. Uh, one, you've got the new planner and the couple forming a connection. Two, you still show up for your client. You're like, I am here. I am supporting you. I'm making sure that you are heard. I'm making sure that your new planner hears you. And it's such a warm handoff. It's such a better way of making that connection and having two or three meetings overlap before passing off care, right? I was going to say it's a white glove service, but it's not. It's just, it's, it's caring. It's kind. It makes a couple feel seen and, and it makes them feel like that is above and beyond, right? Because uh, most people would assume, oh, you know, for whatever reason you're pregnant, you have to stop giving us wedding planning care. We're automatically going to get dumped into someone else's lap. So any overlap you can do will set you up for success. That also means before and or after these meetings, meeting with this other planner and going, hey, here's what to expect. Here's a little bit of backstory. Um, afterwards, debriefing for 15 minutes could be really helpful. Here's what I heard. Is that what you heard? Great. Let's write that down. I also love doing this via Zoom to record these in case the planner needs to go back. Again, this is like fire hose of information today. So hopefully, hopefully y'all are jotting this down because I want to make sure that you feel as prepared as possible. Now, remember, you don't have to do all these things. This is just like the smoothest and straightest path to success when it comes to this. Wrap up that point. If you're doing long-term planning, overlap your services either with the lead that you are training or with an outside planner. I don't even know what point we're on because I didn't number them, but this one takes intention and vulnerability. You're going to have to talk to this assistant with, a, with realness because they kind of need to know right? They kind of need to know, hey, sorry if this is TMI, uh, we're trying for a baby and I would like to leave my company in capable hands towards the end of my pregnancy and during my maternity leave. I think you're fantastic and I'd like for this to be you. However you choose to have this conversation is up to you or you can wait until you're pregnant. It all depends on what you're comfortable with sharing and how vulnerable you want to be and how many details you want to share because you might be like, I don't care about being vulnerable. I don't want to share that many details. That's on you. But you do need to have a conversation ahead of time or early in your pregnancy to tell this person, hey, here's my plan, okay? Because if they get overwhelmed by that, and I've had this happen with assistants before, where I'm like, hey, I want to train you up to be a lead, and that sounds fancy until we start training, and then they're like, I don't like it. And you're like, what? You said you wanted it. It's okay. They didn't know. They had no idea how stressful it was. We got to give grace in this situation, right? If they actually see this happening, the end inside of them planning on their own, they might get overwhelmed. You got to talk to them. You got to keep them in the loop. Let them know what's up um, and let them know when you're pregnant. Speaking of letting people know when you're pregnant. Next point. When we found out we were pregnant with my son, my clients were some of the first to find out. I did not make any sort of public declaration on Instagram. Nothing. And even though it would be my personal channel or my personal brand, whatever, none of my clients were blindsided by that information. Same when I was pregnant with Amelia. None of my clients were blindsided by that information. They all had personal contact from me first. Phone call. Like not just like, hey, FYI, here's an email, you know, and they had phone calls with me or I told them at one of our meetings. And then because I had already set up this plan of attack, I laid out what my plan would look like should anything happen to interfere with their event. I assuaged their concerns immediately. Some of them were like, oh my gosh, we don't even care. Congratulations. And others of them were like, yes, please tell me how my event is not going to be ruined by your, your fetus. Thank you so much. Because different clients have different needs. And I don't think it's judgmental or rude of them to go immediately to their concern. So it is my job to assuage those concerns. Then you'd go through and list out everything we just talked about, except for the contract part, because that should already be in there. Here's the deal. Lauren's been working with me for three years now. She is a lead planner. She's fantastic. Here's how this is going to happen. Come heck or high water, I'm going to be at every single meeting with you. For the last two meetings, Lauren will be joining us to learn more about your event. Also, because we host a lot of these meetings on Zoom, I'm recording them and saving them should she need to refer back to them. So I have all of this wrapped up in a neat little package, ready to go for her. Um, and then she will meet with us for the last two meetings. And then she will run your wedding day. Now, if for any reason I am incapable 
of joining meeting or should I run into any sort of pregnancy related symptoms that prevents me from helping with planning? Here's my plan of attack there. We'll pull Lauren in sooner, whatever that happens to look like. They need to hear a good, decent, solid plan because sometimes pregnancies are complicated. I am a poster child for complicated pregnancies and not like in a life endangering way. Like I just have something called an irritable uterus and it is a weird condition to talk to people about, but that's what I have. <laughs> I have an obscene amount of Braxton Hicks, which makes it difficult to walk, which affects wedding planning a lot, <laughs> like a lot, a lot. Uh, this last pregnancy sucked. I had to leave a wedding early, like, and I have never had to do that before, but physically I couldn't stand anymore. I had to go sit down because I was having so many contractions. So your clients don't necessarily need to hear all those details, but they need to hear that you're taking care of them. And no matter what, you're still going to get people that are pissed off. We did a, um, a podcast forever ago, back when Heather was still here. Uh, I mean, she's still here. She's just not on the podcast anymore. Speaking of babies, she just had one. And uh, I read a letter from a disgruntled groom and I think I alluded to this or I probably even said it in this podcast, but like he was mad that I didn't show up at their wedding and sit on a bench several weeks after giving birth. He's like, you could have just sat on one of the wooden benches and directed everybody. And reading through this letter, it's like kind of silly. All of the excuses or frustrations. One of them was like, because I didn't post a wedding planner as a guard outside the bride's room. Like we never agreed to be bodyguards. That's not what we agreed to do. Apparently there was people that were trying to get in and they were frustrated at us for not covering that. Things like that where you're just like, wait, what? What do you, that's not our, uh, when did I give you that impression? What it boiled down to though is they had a very special connection with me and that wasn't met by the planners that ran their day, which is disheartening, which is unfortunate. But there's only so much prep work I can do. And there is an element of this that's like, that is endearing. They loved working with me so much that no one else could fill that void for them. And that's sweet, but it also makes me sad right? Because I, I I, mean, this was one of my early weddings. So I didn't know that this could be such a mess. Um, so learn from my mistakes or just learn from, you know, my reflecting on it. I could not have done anything to make them happy. I could not. Nothing I could have done would have made them happy except for sitting on a bench, which I would have been miserable. Um, I'm sorry. Just try shoving a kid out of a small place and then sitting on a wood bench for eight hours. No. And this event was an hour and a half from my house. So that would have been, and with a newborn baby that I'm breastfeeding. No, no. So at a certain point, you have to recognize that you can't make everyone happy and someone might just get mad. Then we just need to prepare ourselves with some language to basically say, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Maybe you feel the need to refute each and every point. Uh, I didn't necessarily do that with this client because I knew that he was just mad. Just wanted to be mad. But at this point, it's just saving yourself from a bad review. And I know that sounds callous and I know it sounds uncaring, but it's like, all right, well, what can we do to wrap this up, put a bow on it and make sure that you are <laughs> not going to go bash me online for having a child uh, and being unavailable to attend. If you are clear with your assistant slash soon to be lead planner and or the planner coming in, here's what I need. You got to be clear. Do not assume anything. And if you are clear with your clients, here's what we're going to give you. Do not assume anything. Make sure they know and are fully assured of all the services that will still be rendered, whether or not you are capable of rendering them yourself. You owe it to them to cover all of those and make sure you're discussing all of those. You'll find that, honestly, it can be a relatively smooth process. With this last wedding that I did, uh, my pregnancies like get harder and harder. Uh, as time goes on, so that's the, why I had to leave one early. The clients knew very early on, they probably, I think they found out before even some family members because <laughs> they hadn't picked their date yet, but they knew they wanted to work with me because they're such sweet angel baby nuggets. Um, and I was like, hey, uh, my due date's like mid-May, so there could be a chance that like I won't function well at your event. I don't know. I've had problems with pregnancies in the past and it just gets, you know, I'll be good. I'm not, it's not life-threatening. I'm fine, but just FYI, here's the expectation just in case. Um, and I ended up bringing extra assistance. So I had two that day and they were covered. They were covered, covered, covered. I under-promised and over-delivered. It is absolutely possible to have a thriving wedding planning business and have babies. You guys, I have four children. I have a homestead with 60 plus animals on it. I run two podcasts, two YouTube channels, and my house is not in total shambles. I get that I'm a go-getter, but with enough planning, you can make this happen. 
You totally can. It is not impossible to have babies and run your business. You just need to figure out what you're going to prioritize and when. Obviously, when you have a baby, you are forced to prioritize that. You don't really have a choice, right? But if you can plan ahead and make sure you're structuring your business well, you will get out of this relatively unscathed. Again, there's a chance that people will still be frustrated and not everyone's going to be thrilled for you. And while that's a callous thing to say, um, some people are more self-absorbed <laughs> and some clients might be more self-absorbed too. It's their wedding day. They get to be a little bit to a certain extent. But also, it's your baby, so so do you. Uh, so it's just about managing that. <laughs> that sounded so callous. So I hope this helped. If there are more follow-up questions, please let me know. If you enjoyed this episode, go leave a review. I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback on this specifically. I know this is something that haunts a lot of women. Like, how do I plan for the unplannable, for the unpredictable, especially when infertility is so rife? Like, what do we do? Well, we knock out endocrine disruptors, that's for sure, and we supplement our body with vitamins and minerals. But that is a story for another time. Any hoodles, I adore you guys. I really hope this helps. You can have it all. You can have both. You just got to figure out how to balance it. And I don't mean work-life balance because that is a crock of garbage. But I do mean plan ahead and then carve out some time for you to be with your sweet, sweet baby. Oh, wait, I'm going to say this before we go. And if any of you left the podcast already, then you're going to miss out on this beautiful little nugget. Give yourself eight weeks off, okay? 12 if you can. Because six weeks as maternity leave is not enough. It's not enough. Uh, Eight weeks also feels like not enough. I started to feel more like a normal human at the 12 week mark with, uh, well, with the twins. My first round was twins. I I didn't feel normal for for a while. (laughs) Actually, no, probably around eight weeks. Um, I had a C-section with them and then I had a home birth with the other two, which again, I love talking about. So anytime you want to chat about it, you just call me. No, you can't call me. I'm not going to give you my cell phone number, but whatever. (laughs) But it takes time for baby to adjust. So this last one, I was like, I am so grateful that I had like three months afterwards before returning to some work stuff. It was such a game changer. I needed it. I needed my rhythm, especially if you've never done done this before. You need to give yourself a generous maternity leave. You get to, please, like make room, make space for this. Make sure that you're not returning back to work too early, especially if you're breastfeeding because you want to really cultivate that relationship. You need to spend a lot of time with this baby, a lot of time nursing to make sure that this is going successfully. So don't cut your maternity break too short, especially if you want to end up breastfeeding for as long as possible. You need to cultivate that relationship. It's not something that automatically is just done. And I've done it with all four children and you still need to figure out that rhythm because it's a new baby and it's a new person. And if this is something you want to do, you have to dedicate time to it. Okay. I will get off my soapbox. That's what we have for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you happen to be watching this over on YouTube, jump on over to wherever podcasts are played. I'm going to go ahead and link it right here. Um, and you can hear me talk more businessy things because I love talking about business. I get super excited about it. I don't even move my teeth. Okay. <laughs> and until next time, bye guys.